and what i personally felt is when i've talked to the stakeholders it could be also the business experts the data scientists one thing everybody says is that it just makes sense a lot of people are always scared when we talk about casual ai and all because it's just so good so they are be are you replacing my job what i wanted to do is that maybe i use llms to see that how the external world is can affect some of the suppliers but the result i got was really hey causal bandits welcome to the causal bandits podcast the best podcast on causality and machine learning on the internet today we're traveling back to munich to meet our guest he realized the potential of data at the age of 10 while being a cricket player he's a passionate traveler who visited 25 countries and lived in 5 he loves polish pierogi and a good time at the gym makes him happy lead data scientist at bmw group and a truly entrepreneurial spirit Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Ishanch Gupta. Let me pass it to your host, Alex Mola. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ishanch Gupta. Thanks a lot for this warm introduction and happy to be here. Happy to have you here. Ishanch, where are we today? So, we are in this beautiful uh city in Germany, Munich, in the Bavarian area, and it happens to be a beautiful lovely day. sunny and warm and especially at this time of the year to have this is uh, always exciting and uh, beautiful how did you end up living in this beautiful city so uh, it's 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 a long story uh, i've always been wanting to live abroad uh, started with my fascination of wanting to be in us then uh, during my bachelor's in india i got a chance to uh, travel to cairo for an internship as a web- website developer really like the international experience of being abroad and uh, i knew that this is what i want want to do and even at that time i really wanted to be uh, still in us uh, but then got this chance to be in poland uh, in 2016 and 2017 uh, and 2018 winter to just uh, explore europe travel around but also to teach data science to the youth and also improve their language skills and i really liked what i learned when i got a chance to visit germany over christmas I uh, really liked uh, the word free education it something resonated with me in a in a in, a, in an amazing way and then yeah I just uh, applied to german university got uh, full scholarship in one of the universities in northern germany and uh, that's how i uh, landed here in germany you mentioned web development um so data science was not the only uh, thing that you're interested in uh, within this broader field of computer science uh tell me about the day when you felt that machine learning and causality in particular is something that you cannot imagine yourself in the future without i mean i did my bachelor's in computer science and uh, one thing i always was sure that it's a vast area like computer science there are a lot of things to do from website development to android development and this then comes this uh, big data thing with all the data science artificial intelligence so i wanted to explore different things try out different things and then wanted to see that what suits me so i started uh, through website development uh, then i went to android development and um, then uh, i got a chance to uh, go into data science absolutely love uh, data science working with numbers predicting stuff and just being ahead of the game it started with my fascination of just uh, predicting something with the stocks because i'm also into stock investments and then also just predicting that uh, if my team will do uh, good or uh, bad so it just started with uh, with a hobby then it became profession and then i always felt that there was this missing thing in data science especially when it comes to the explainability part there's always black box modeling and in the end it's just mere predictions and not business recommendations so one thing also about me is i come from an entrepreneurship background so i always like to keep my entrepreneurship hat on so whatever may come the situation So when I am a data scientist I'm predicting something working in a corporate I'm not just thinking as a data scientist predicting I want to make a difference and um, I want to have some actionable insights and that's one thing I always felt missing and then I came into causality and I I saw that just connecting the missing puzzle and that's uh, really what I liked what I what I learned uh, in in causal machine learning because it really was able to um, I'll say covered the areas of explainability, um, black box modeling, and then it was way more than just prediction. It was also business recommendation, 
and then just the capability to do what if uh, counterfactual uh, scenarios. So that's uh, how I came into co uh, causal uh, machine learning field. What was the first moment when you heard about causality? It started with just mere Googling. So uh, imagine just me just Googling some of the stuff like explainability or also how, how I can input the tribal knowledge into my models, which will be still different than human aided reinforcement learning. And yeah, then uh, while I was researching during my uh, PhD, I got to know about uh, this uh, causal machine learning and uh, saw some of the videos, saw some of the talks. There were not enough. And I'm talking about uh, around three to four years uh, ago. Even then, it was not a lot of stuff about uh, causal machine learning. Then read this book, The Book of Why by Judah Pearl. Uh, amazing book. And uh, yeah, I mean, th that's when I got into uh, causal machine learning and uh, that's how I really wanted to know a bit more about that. Your PhD program uh, was combining theoretical work, research work with applied practical um, uh, side. Can you tell us a little bit more about your PhD? What was, what was its main focus and its connection to causality and causal learning? Uh, yes, sure. So um, one thing I also liked about Germany is uh, they have these PhD programs where you can work in industry and then also still connect it with to uh, academics. So personally, I've never wanted to do PhD, uh, but just, just I really liked when I got to know about these kind of programs uh, in Germany, I, I applied to one. And yeah, just, just an idea to still do some uh, practical work from what you have learned in the research papers and it's not just, just researching, it's also development was super exciting for me because I'm usually one of those guys who will read something on uh, LinkedIn or some of the research papers and really want to do it right away. Where in a conventional PhD, sometimes you just don't get a chance because you are really stuck in the literature review. You really, 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 really want to go deep into that. And it's still going deep, but it still gives you the chance of uh, practically applying what you have learned. And best part is seeing right away the results in the industry that how it can affect some of the business decisions. Maybe we can end up saving a lot of money. Maybe we can influence some other things. So that's uh, pretty exciting for me. So what was the main topic uh, of interest that you focused your attention on in your, in your PhD work? Yes, so uh, I come from supply chain background. Supply chain has always been interesting for me. Also, why? Because where I did my master's uh, from no Northern Germany in uh, data engineering, a few of my uh, batchmates, they, they came from the supply chain management and we also used to have some of the classes uh, combined. And I really liked uh, to know a bit more about supply chain because I saw a lot of use cases combining uh, machine learning there. So, um, and yeah, I mean, the, really wanted to go into supply chain uh, management. And right now, if you see the supply chain, it's uh, really complex. I think more than ever, because you combine things like the geopolitical issues, or you talk about the pandemics like Corona, or you talk about uh, the semiconductor issue, which is specifically affecting the automotive industry a lot. I see it. These are urgent problems that needs to be addressed. But it's also an opportunity for the companies to be ahead of the game. And uh, that's that's where I see a big use of machine learning, especially causal machine learning coming into play, helping the uh, business requirement owners uh, make uh, better uh, data backed decisions, but also not just uh, predictions, but business recommendations. What challenges do you think uh, causal machine learning can can address in supply chain? That traditional solutions, statistical machine learning solutions cannot address? So I'll, I'll, I'll talk it in a way of uh, some of the conversations I had with the management or for example, I worked in different industries from uh, sports industry to now working uh, in automotive. When you talk to these people uh, as a data scientist, you go to them, um, they have a big responsibility to make uh, big decisions and they'll always ask you the questions like, okay, explain me the model, talk to me about that, what exactly cost something and tell me the next step. And it seems a very obvious question and it is, but sometimes the data scientists still struggle explaining them about the accuracy scores, the root mean square. Then you talk about the post hoc explainability methods like Lime and Chap. And this is exactly we start losing those stakeholders because they just don't believe in them. They don't want to play around with it. And uh, that's that's where the gap is. So what, what I felt or what I wanted to research upon is that how about we try to compare the traditional descriptive and uh, uh, diagnostic analytics with the predictive part 
and then the cohesion analytics and then see that how stakeholders feel about that and the results we got were uh, really satisfying but yeah i mean coming to the problems addressing part i think the explainability part they're really uh, explainable the models because of the causal discovery graphs then you can run these simulations the what if simulations uh, you can play around have different simulations so not only historical simulation but also the future uh, scenarios which gives stress to the management so in the end i always try to relate it with the trust factor because the stakeholders they trust it more why also is because their knowledge is sometimes in the models so they actually see it as an extension of their own brain and 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 they really like to play around with it and they 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 really enjoy uh, it and maybe the models won't be the best or the perfect models initially but eventually they do become because the management the trust in it and they want to make it better i had a very interesting conversation some time ago with uh, juan orduz from vault or walt um and he shared with me that in his practice this is very common to build causal models in an iterative fashion so rather than thinking about just defining all relevant parameters in advance and then running some computations and mm. going home we would rather build something maybe overly simplified but something that we are pretty sure about and then iterate over this triangulate the results of the model with real data over time mm. and collect more expert knowledge over time and improve the structural information up to the point where where the model uh gives us something something useful uh is this iterative approach something that you could also relate to in your work i do and i think it's a really good strategy because initially we as people we try to hit the home run every time but in corporate it's not always the best strategy why because people uh, you always need to have the trust from the stakeholders you start small you start simple and i think then you build on to something beautiful is always the right, right strategy but there's a fine line between making something simple but also you also want to give these stakeholders something extra because then they'll always say that ah okay i don't need a model to tell you let's say my worst supplier because i already know it uh, that this will be my worst supplier if i see the trend so you always need to give them some something extra but i think starting from something small something simple is always uh, a good strategy and then you can always build on to it uh, to something more beautiful you mentioned causal discovery at some point as well we know that uh, causal discovery might be very challenging in real world settings because of the limitations of the methods and we can have some we yeah. have some theorems showing that those challenges are deeply ingrained in the uh, I I don't want to say in reality but uh, let's say in, in in this thinking about I, about causality there there are some fundamental limitations um, what was your experience with those methods and how did you deal with the challenge that we cannot have a guarantee that those methods give us reliable results yes so i mean i'll say these models are of course not not the most perfect but i think we as humans also are not the perfect so uh, there are always human biases existing but i see causal discovery or causal machine learning in general as a way to reduce this human biases so my experience with these algorithms have been pretty positive so uh, i've done the study where i've interviewed different experts and tried to come up with a tribal knowledge graph of let's say that how the external world or external factors or these news are affecting say so the backlogs of the suppliers or you can change uh, any kind of different use case if you want to predict something why and you want to understand that what are different factors affecting it so uh, in the end you will have this uh, beautiful tribal knowledge graph uh, which you can take it as the ground truth so what i personally wanted to test it out that i just throw in the data and uh, let these algorithms run this causal discovery algorithm and then see that how close it to the ground truth uh, because now i al- al- already have this beautiful ground truth and the results i got was really satisfying uh, which i was pleasantly surprised i tried out different algorithms saw some of the results which were really close to the ground truth but i also always feel that you need a business expert at some stage always who can testify that okay this is something that makes sense or maybe you correct this particular edge and it will make more sense and it can even get the uh, business expert thinking that maybe this could make sense and uh, that's always the exciting part so for me i think i'll say that these algorithms are not perfect and but but uh, like i started so are we
What would be your advice to people who would like to apply causal discovery algorithms in, in their use cases? Uh, what, what, what would be the main lessons that you would like to share with those people? So I'll say just first, get your hands dirty and just try, try them out. Uh, what always is necessary is you have to also look at what kind of relationship is between the data, whether it's linear, non-linear, uh, and of course, you still have to follow the conventional methods of um, data science, data engineering in general. You have to work with the clean data. You have to do all those stuff. But yeah, getting uh, hands dirty, try, try out different things, try, try out different visualizations, and then have always this domain expert try to validate it. It's uh, definitely will be one of my uh, biggest lessons and uh, the teachings that I'll give to, give to the people. Try out different algorithms. I think there are some really good algorithms existing uh, open source and um, uh, then see how, how how the results are. For this part of our audience that is interested more in technical details, which algorithms worked well in your case? I think PC algorithm is always uh, a good one, particularly for my use case if I've, uh, I've, I have to share. So I use this algorithm called Resist, uh, performed really beautifully well uh, where I wanted to compare that how the tribal knowledge graph that I obtained from interviewing the experts, like around 25 experts, uh, can I get something close to by, by using these algorithms and resist performed really, really well. And what I wanted to predict is uh, get this causal discovery graph of how different internal supplier performance KPIs, let's say backlogs or wrong deliveries or special transports, which are very general KPIs in supply chain, uh, but they're still not straightforward that how they are connected to one another. And uh, the causal discovery graph I got was really, really close to the ground truth. But that also means like some other algorithms, um, like, like like I said, PC and all, it doesn't mean that they are not good or bad. It just it depends solely to that particular task and that particular thing that you want to predict or if it's suitable for your kind of data. What have you learned about interviewing the subject matter experts uh, during this process? You said you interviewed 25 people. What would be the main lessons that you could share with the community to make this process more Mm. effortless for them so interviewing experts is uh, i'll say one of the more necessary things and it is really necessary uh, or it can be amazing uh, in in uh, causal machine learning models later on so interviewing them uh, first you have to do it in a very non-biased way so maybe i can also recommend some of the uh, methods like uh, multi-criteria decision ship making methods specifically you can use fahp or topsys or uh, analytic hierarchy process I think they're really good, which ensures that there's some consistency in when you are interviewing the experts, there are no human biases. And then you have this uh, normal conversation with them and try to find this cause and effect relationships. Let's say, for example, in my use case, I wanted to know that how the external world is affecting uh, the backlogs of my suppliers or different KPIs of my suppliers. So, so you talk with them, you try to together build this tribal knowledge uh, graph with them and then testify. And uh, I think one, one thing also is that usually even experts won't realize initially that they know uh, that, that much. So that was a very interesting observation that I found. And I'll sit down with them for a hour or two workshop. And in the end, we'll have this beautiful DAG graph. And uh, even they'll be like, yeah, okay, th this is really, really amazing. So one thing is just, just keep asking those questions, motivating them to, to tell more, ask uh, things in detail. And uh, yeah, in the end, like still uh, get that particular graph validated and make sure that it's a DAG so that it could be utilized in uh, causal machine learning. We, we had a dinner together yesterday and I remember you said one thing that I really, I really loved um, that is related to what you're speaking about now, that constructing those graphs is a way, of course, it's a way of gathering information, valuable information, but also it's a way of in a sense, building a monument for the knowledge of people uh, in the organization. So even if somebody was for 30 years in the organization, maybe this person is retiring now or mm. just changing the, the company, uh, their knowledge, the, the legacy is somehow saved in this, in this graphical structure. And I found it very, uh, very beautiful. So yeah, I mean, talking about that, like it's always beautiful for me to know that, for example, I've worked in different industries, different companies, and just to know that maybe some of my work is still existing in the company and is creating a difference is always amazing and 
trying to relate it uh, with causal machine learning or these graphs is that i always imagine it as a chance that to utilize all these abundance of knowledge existing in these experts and just utilizing in uh, making a difference um, uh, and even when they leave a company that knowledge somehow still stays within the company and i think it's really really beautiful and that's where even the companies in corporate they'll have the best uh usage of 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 these experts and um, yeah i think it's already a kind of a plus situation and a win win situation because you as an expert will be thinking that okay my knowledge will always be existing within the company in these models i'll always even though i'll leave the company i'll still be able to make a difference and i think this gives gives you happiness and also for a company i think it's beautiful that they have invested a lot a lot in a person and their knowledge Uh, can be utilized and able to make these uh, differences so the impact is is lasting impact is lasting and impact is loss, uh, lasting forever many people in in the causal community um are considering today the ways that we could leverage the power of generative ai in order to make causal learning causal processes causal discovery more efficient yeah faster um or maybe just better what are your thoughts about this intersection of those two fields exciting to begin with and yeah i've tried to explore that too so uh, one of the challenges uh, or uh, i'll also say when i used to interview these expert was it takes a lot of time to gather that meaningful relationships and the dag it it takes a lot of time by asking them a lot of questions and um, for example in general it will take at least 2 3 hours to interview an expert and if you are talking about interviewing 25 experts it's more than 50 hours it's 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 a lot of time and sometimes in corporate you don't find uh, that much time now the role of the, uh, of llms how i see is that it can be definitely used to expedite the process of causal discovery so now what i'm saying is that instead of starting from scratch uh with these experts where i'll have little to no knowledge about uh, uh their domain i just go to llms and try to find these causal relationships build already a causal discovery graph and then uh, let the expert uh, validate it or he can criticize it which is also good for me and eventually they'll build on to that because what we have also learned is that people really like to criticize they really like to but also th- they want to validate things also because they want to show their knowledge and uh i think it's a good way of instead of starting from scratch have something and then build something way more meaningful to that and uh, i, I want to share this experience is that uh, the research i was working on where i was interviewing this experts more than 40 to 50 hours uh saw these interesting um, papers with llms and uh, causal ai then really wanted to utilize llms uh i was not expecting a lot because what i wanted to do is that maybe i use llms to see that how the external world is can affect some of the suppliers but the result i got was really close to the ground truth just after one or two prompts so that really got me thinking is that just after two or three prompts you can get so amazing results which is so closer to the ground truth and that definitely makes sense of instead of starting things from scratch using this as a recommendation and then build something more meaningful meaningful to that so it's it sounds to me like it's not only an efficiency booster it's also an, an additional element that can motivate your experts your experts to uh to give you to give you uh more of the knowledge uh, more of the knowledge because they want to show that their knowledge is there and they want to uh, share it with the world uh, yes so uh, i think even they had some of the surprising reactions to what what they learned uh what what the llms can do and the potential but in a really good way because uh, they they appreciated uh, what these models were uh, recommending in the causal discovery graph but yeah of course they wanted to add more into that because they wanted to show show their knowledge they wanted to show their unique experiences which i'm pretty sure in every industry every expert will have some of the unique exper- experiences uh, despite of uh, whatever length they have been at their company but yeah it was really satisfying to see that thing and yeah i think it builds more trust and i think uh, future of most industries personally i feel and especially in supply chain i see is it's not just about better technology or more te- technology but i think better trust and i think causal discovery really really helps us bridge that trust deficit what are your thoughts about evaluating systems like this so 
evaluation i think it's still a challenge even in a casual world but that's where i've always felt the role of stakeholders or these business experts becomes even bigger it it's definitely it, it does not reduce but what happens is that we make things simpler for them by 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 making this casual uh discovery uh, visualizations where they can see all these edges where they can see the effect it can have when they take a certain action they can run simulations and i think simulation capability these counterfactual capability is something always management wants and uh there's always a causal question in the end by the management so if they can already run through it so that's where uh even though initially the model won't be perfect it will be eventually when they start playing around with with it and that's where i i I know that there are these data evolution metrics also in the uh, causal world like talking about the causal discovery methods we have the SHTs hamming distance number of indirect edges but I like to read on those numbers but not totally depend on that because eventually like I said the role of the stakeholders and these business experts it's still a lot and especially in uh, the causal world I think it becomes even even more at some point in your career you worked for a famous german uh football club called Werder Bremen do you see that causality can also be applied in the context of sports yeah i think it 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 definitely is not restricted towards um any particular in- industry so for example if i want to know that maybe what caused a, a sports person injury so doing this root cause analysis and also i could maybe play around with some of the variables so if i want to say that okay xyz player what if this person will sleep 8 hours instead of the 6 hours he's sleeping right now what effect uh, it could have on the match performance Let, let's say the expected goals which is a really important kpi that that we try to track in the sports industry or maybe just just in him getting injured or not which is again a really important kpi because in sports industry also we always want to know what's the status of the person whether he'll be injured or not because that could really a make or break a, tre- a team so uh, i think the potential is immense and uh, not only restricted towards a specific industry like sports or automotive it can be applied to pretty much everywhere is the future causal i think it's already the present particularly uh, i see that it has been highlighted way more because of the recent events and yes specifically relating with the supply chain with all these uh, issues that i mentioned earlier with the eastern european war or uh, these uh, pandemic and the semiconductor issue definitely got highlighted a bit more and people really realized that there is a need of something more and there's something missing about the these these are black box models in the end so that's where i feel that uh, a lot of companies have gone into this uh, causal world exploring things and even Im- implementing it right away so i'll say um, in future it will be even more and lately i've seen the trend in the past one year it has definitely expedited but uh, i see definitely a lot of companies using it right now and in future it it will only increase what will be your advice for companies that are interested in applying causal methodology causal inference causal discovery in their work but they don't know what should be the first or the first two three steps uh, to take so i see um, an interesting uh, thing in the companies where it's very common for them to go this descriptive diagnostic way to predictive and then the prescriptive part so i always like to associate causal ai with this prescriptive part more and in the end like it's always about what the business wants and uh, that's where the causal ai comes into the play so my advice also always is to why not move straight forward into this world of actionable intelligence why causal intelligence instead of just going this ladder way because eventually what most of the companies already realize is that when we do this predictive way uh we don't go beyond the experimental phase a lot because of 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 these common problems about the explainability and uh, the stress deficit and um people don't trust these uh, post hoc explainability methods so just trying out this actionable intelligence and it definitely needs a bit of research too uh, because it's not that straightforward it's something new also for the most of the data scientists working in the industry so to start with a bit of research but then trying it out and what i personally felt is when i've talked to the stakeholders it could be also the business experts the data scientists one thing everybody says is that it just makes sense and uh, i think even if these companies are not using it right now they will eventually because of the of these issues so they don't have a choice and Uh, I think um, causal AI is something that will definitely help them. 
many people are starting with causality, they experience something that I call the fundamental fear of causality, which is asking the question, how do I know if my DAG is, is correct? What, what would you say to those people? So, I mean, um, it also comes to the evaluation metrics part. So that's where I'll potentially answer in the same line that, yes, uh, you can always throw them these numbers regarding uh, the hamming distance, the SHTs, number of indirect edges. You, you can do your best. And I think it's always, always required because not only you have to talk to the stakeholders, but you have to discuss it with other data scientists. And that's where you can throw them all these metrics. But eventually it just comes down to the business experts. So what we also are doing is that a lot of people are always scared when we talk about causal AI and all because it's just so good. So they'll be, are you replacing my job? But when they actually try it out there, they always think that it's extension of 100% their own knowledge. So just involving them a bit more in this process of the evaluation is always a, uh, always a good idea. And I think that's always a way where they will be like, okay, we are pretty sure that, okay, this edge makes sense. Uh, but okay, this thing definitely does not make sense. It's always also a good idea about interviewing multiple experts uh, because then again, we'll have this human bias, bias problem. So always good to have uh, interview different experts. In the scenario, yes, if we don't have experts, then it's a very different uh, scenario. But usually in corporate, of course, you will have the, 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 these tribal knowledge and the, the experts. Uh, but in that case, um, definitely you can only give the data evaluation metrics. You mentioned that one of the challenges you see in uh, broader application of causality is that data scientists themselves might not be familiar with with the methods. What would be the two free resources that you'd recommend data scientists interested in this topic to start with? So I think it's very mental thing also because uh, uh, it's it's something hard to believe that something like this exists. And when you talk about all these assumptions and do calculates, it's, it's something very different. And most of the people, they, they have not learned it um, uh, in their education. So I'll always recommend them to start with this book of uh, the book of why, which also changed, will change their mindset. And I think specifically, the, lately, this book, uh, Causal Inference and Discovery in Python by you, I think it's, it's a revolutionary book, if I have to put it that way. Uh, because one thing is people of Python. And uh, about this book, one thing I really like is also learning by doing. You see all these examples, you first learn their theory and uh, then you just apply right away and you see the results. And I think that's where the people will have more ideas. They'd be like, okay, this is something I can associate with my use case. Let me try this thing. Uh, you talk about the connection with the LLMs then you talk also about NLP. And when you talk about all these familiar things, the data scientists, people will know that, okay, it's not a foreign language. It's mm. just, um, so you are learning to do something in, in an even better way. And there's no harm to that. So initially, I'll definitely go the more the mental way to remove that particular barrier in the in the mind, and then just test it out. And uh, I think uh, a lot of data scientists struggled in the test part because they did not have a lot of resources. Yes, we have these open source libraries like do I and all, but uh, not not a lot. But now with with these books and some other books coming in the market right now and amazing research papers, I think people can just get their hands dirty and try out different things. Which research papers did you find personally meaningful or important in your journey into causality? I'll say the most interesting one recently I was reading with uh, um, from Microsoft where they combined the LLMs and uh, the causal AI methods. So that was particularly interesting for me. And uh, again, the part of what you learn, just try to apply it right away. Of course, you will not always have that uh, chance to do that because of the time or some other con constraints. But Particularly, I like that and I just uh, used it in my particular use case and I saw the results and uh, they were very much in line with what Microsoft was claiming. So one tip always will be to keep in trend with all these research papers. And uh, I think LinkedIn is an amazing resource and a very underrated tool. So I'll see the post from uh, all these casual amb amb ambassadors, including you or some other companies. And I'll always be thinking about some different uh, problems in the causal way, ca causal world. and uh, there's answer right away. So one other tip will be to just always connect with these people on LinkedIn, ask them questions because that will also get them thinking because I always love to read these comment sections mm -hmm. uh, whenever someone is uh, posting a research paper about causality and all and they'll be like, oh, okay, maybe you could have done this way also or I love the way you did it. 
so um i think i think it's a brilliant community right now on linkedin and uh, definitely one of the underrated tips um uh, here in your career you you wore many hats so you were an entrepreneur you worked for for a sports team you work you you, you currently work for an uh one of the leading world's leading automotive companies um what was the real role of networking in your path so networking is even uh i think one of the most important things and um the more you climb the ladder in corporate the more you realize that it's all about getting the right people in a meeting to get things done and you might say that it, it's a very easy thing but it's not it's the easiest thing in the world and the most difficult thing in the world uh, at the same time so even in my use case when i had to utilize this casual discovery get it testified by the experts or interview all these expert you need networking because it's not straight forward you have to convince them to talk about like uh, for hours like 2 hours 3 hours discussing about their tribal knowledge so networking is always huge and i also like to do a different kind of networking where i'll talk to different kind of demographics people uh, from a very different field like it could be a lawyer friend or someone who uh, is into a medical field and try to uh, discuss my my problems that i'm facing in the industry and uh, get their point of view and sometimes you will have the most amazing ideas like that so networking i think it's really beautiful it's really necessary and i definitely see it as prerequisite if you want to have success also in the casual world because you always need these experts to validate your casual models and uh, give you suggestions who would you like to thank i'll say starting uh, my family with uh, the support that they've given so i come from a very interesting background of a medical background where my parents my sister all of them they they are doctors so just to give me the support of uh, letting me do what i wanted to do because i've always been intrigued with the data uh, world since i was a kid and like you mentioned like as a, a 10 year old kid so i'll definitely thank my parents for that but also like uh, the friends and definitely i won't forget the linkedin community because that has really really uh, um affected me in a positive way and uh, uh really really helped me get one of the best ideas uh whenever i've been stuck i just just i always have linkedin installed in my phone like i always try to read out sometimes i'll be in a club or a pub and i'll see all these interesting research paper in the casual uh, world and um, always happy so just to all these uh, random people on linkedin uh, doing the good work uh, i think these are the people i really want to thank you mentioned your parents what would be the one or two things that they did that made you feel that they really supported you i think the first thing of course was allowing me to go into this wonderful field of data uh, rather than medical which is a very uncommon thing if you are coming from a medical background in india more or less you will go into this medical field second was giving me this freedom to travel around and experience different cultures and different things like allowing me to go to Cairo or allowing me to go to Poland and Warsaw or Lublin or now just allowing me to be in Germany so i think this was uh, really beautiful for me and just even though they don't understand a lot of my field they're always supportive and all, uh, i always used to even now i have these conversations even about casual machine learning with them because i want to understand their perspective i talk to them a lot about llms so just being willing to uh, do this active listening part by the parents and then just giving genuine recommendations and suggestions as uh, wonderful you also mentioned the the linkedin community uh, who are the people you would recommend to follow in in machine learning or causality so there are a lot of interesting companies that i can definitely recommend to follow causal lenses one of them i think they they do incredible work if you go onto the web- website they have done some really brilliant research and also in uh, industries they have done some impactful work uh then of course like you uh, i think you have a really good community but also you post a lot uh, and uh, some some relevant stuff and yeah i mean j- just uh i'll say just connect with a lot of people from academics also because uh they they are the ones who will always try to uh learn the most recent thing and uh the interesting ones also are from the uh, from the industries where we, you'll see a different kind of use case being applied like people from spotify or netflix you see that okay ah okay maybe i can apply this thing in uh, my use case too so i'll say follow different kind of people with coming from different demographics different companies uh, research 
um, academics and and industries. You mentioned academic people. Uh, in many of my conversations, there is this topic. It appears somewhere uh, that some people, even though some of them studied things like statistics, they learned about causality much much later after they've graduated. They finished their studies because the programs were not talking about causality, even if causality was somehow uh, or would seem for us maybe a relevant topic within mm. those programs. Do you see a change in academia as a person who is also a supervisor now for, for younger generation, for students? I do. So starting with myself, like I definitely encourage my students to read a bit more about that, about uh, about causality and this whole new world. But I also like I've had a chance to uh, work with and go to different universities, uh, be it uh, TU Munich or LMU or MIT. And uh, I really enjoy these conversations uh, with the current students uh, or the PhDs who are researching right now. And uh, caution machine learning is a big technology in their work. So I think I definitely see the change coming in and it's really, really exciting. And I think it will only get better. I think that's great news. And uh, I'm so happy to see uh, the new generation having this opportunity, at least in some of the universities, uh, to learn about causality during their, during their studies. Because this is also the time when they might have a little bit more space, at least some of them, to go deeper into this topic if they feel interested. And then when they start their career, they're in, in a very different place than, than, than we were. Uh, in the beginning, you also mentioned um, your work in industry and in particular, the idea of uh, those different levels of analytics, starting with descriptive and going to predictive and prescriptive. Um, what are the main insights from this perspective uh, when you look at your work and in the context of causality? So I did want to compare all these three levels um, and then just interview the experts of what they, what they feel about different uh, analytic tools with these kind of technology. The insights were really, really amazing where all of the experts, they, they preferred a causal approach. And that's where I also formed a analytic hierarchy process, again, this multi-criteria decision ship making where we also check the consistency level of these experts, uh, that how uh, biased their answers are or not, and interview different multiple experts in a research way. So the answers you'll get uh, will be pretty accurate. And for me, a few of the more interesting insights were, of course, uh, everybody preferring a causal approach, but things like explainability where Experts clearly did not trusted machine learning that enough, but they really trusted uh, causal machine learning or things like stress test or time to recover capabilities, which is super important in uh, supply chain management. Causal machine learning scored uh, really heavily on that. What also I discovered is that if you combine all the different criteria on which I evaluated these technologies, it could be business, it could be uh, explainability, time to recover, stress test, and all these criteria. Around 48% uh, caution machine learning is a big winner, but you leave it to around 24% for the descriptive part and then the rest to the predictive part. So there is not a much uh, difference between the descriptive and the, pre uh, the predictive part, hmm. which could uh, make you wonder that maybe if you invest a million euros as a management into this predictive part, uh, stakeholders are not willing to believe in that. So for me, what additional benefit I'm getting rather than it just being a fancy word, AI data science, in the end, I'm just not willing to trust it more. The explainability part, I cannot explain it more and results clearly show, showed us this thing. So what, according to my research, I got to know is that these experts for the first time, they didn't just like these results or they or gladly they did not doubt it, but they absolutely loved it. They absolutely loved what they learned. They absolutely loved uh, the causal machine learning, which was a uh, game changing uh, moment for me because these experts really wanted to play with the tool. They, uh, they still play with the tool. They run out, uh, run with all these simulations and uh, come out with different uh, interesting insights. So that was something uh, amazing that I observed from, from, from my experiment. What's next for you? Uh, I'm still very intrigued with what LLMs have to offer in this world, especially combining causal AI with uh, this generative AI and LLM world uh, is definitely interesting. And I also feel that uh, the future of dashboarding 
is definitely having this Kaushal AI plus LLM thing. So I'm imagining I'm in a management role. I'm the decision maker. I go to this my, my phone or my application and type out, okay, tell me the next player which will be uh, get injured because maybe his stress level is increased of uh, XYZ. Maybe someone from his family is affected or maybe he met with an accident or I want to know that there's a tsunami in Miami. Tell me which supplier will be affected and in what way. So to quantify that effect also, I think that is the future. And um, I, th- I think this will uh, come sooner than later. Uh, later and I'm really excited about that. What question would you like to ask me? How would you evaluate your causal models without an, without an expert? So yes, I answered it uh, briefly, but I want to know that how you can convince the management. Would you do some sensitivity analysis or how would you tackle this problem? That's a great question. Um, I think sensitivity analysis and, and partial identification and all those like advanced identification strategies that allow for some types of hidden variables in the model, these are um, highly underrepresented methods in the industry and underrated. Um, of course, they also have their limitations, but they allow us to expand the possible universe of, of use cases where we get valid causal inferences mm, very significantly. So that's one thing. Um, I think what I see in when working with my clients and what I hear also from, from my guests in the podcast is that iterative approach to building a model is, is something that works in many cases, maybe not all cases, but many cases, which means that we might build a model, then compare the distribution from the model with uh, with the observational distribution then if we are able to perform an intervention we intervene maybe on like a small subsample we generate the data from the model and the do operation and, and we compare it and so on um if we don't have experts this this process is, is probably usually uh longer it just takes long mm. mo- mo- more time because we need to discover what otherwise we could learn from from the experts uh, but if we have expert knowledge in some kinds of documents and so on, this uh, this knowledge can also be be retrieved. So we can consult the documents using LLMs that you mentioned. And I think one of the paths that are relatively unexplored in this mm, area, mm, in this area of the intersection between causality and large language models, is using um, retrieval augmented generation. So. We all know that LLMs can hallucinate and RAG, so retrieval augmented generation, usually reduces those hallucinations uh, very, very significantly. And I think this is one of the paths that is also also promising. Um, to wrap it up, I think, I think the readiness to treat this as an iterative process and applying those iterations, applying interventions and comparing this with, with the model these are some interesting paths and definitely uh, partial identifiability and sensitivity analysis are, are also ways to go. Um, regarding interventions, there's also this very interesting um, avenue called optimal experimentation theory where you can where you can um, assess what actions you should take in order to minimize the uncertainty. Uh, in an optimal in an optimal way, so there are papers like ABCI, active Bayesian causal inference, and I know that uh, some some people are working now on extensions of this with less limitations. Uh, and finally, the fourth thing is causal data fusion. So if we have some experimental data already and we have some observational data, there is a good chance that we will be able to to draw causal conclusions from from this data by combining it um, and leveraging this, the structural properties um, of the data set. So yeah, I, w- I would say that th- those four things, although three of them are maybe, uh, uh, maybe they are not necessarily um, directly about evaluation, uh, they can help us understand uh, how good we are doing with, uh, with 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 the model? I'll ask a follow up question on that uh, about this uh, the data metrics. Is the world we live right now is 
a lot of black swan events keep on happening and mm. right now nothing surprises so i had an interesting conversation with a few of the people from my company and we were talking about how about if there's a alien attack i want to know the effect of it on my supply chain how do how do i do it then because then even an expert won't know uh, what what could be the effect or uh, he cannot testify or verify anything where does causality play a role there it's a great question so I, i think we have a couple of uh, we can take a couple of perspectives here um one of them would be that the alien attack uh is a new variable in the system that we just haven't included because it never happened before and we just didn't know that there's a variable like this now of course aliens might impact our um might impact our supply chain directly so they just can come and maybe destroy a production line or or do something like this and i think in this sense it would be very difficult to model uh but there might be also uh, something different so maybe this alien attack is just disturbing or mm, or uh, interfering with certain processes that are indirectly uh, related to our supply chain now if we take into account the markov blanket of our process so the set of variables that we are interested in that they can impact our treatments and our outcomes uh then perhaps we can model the 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 alien attack as an exogenous distribution and uh, if that if this is possible our causal model can still uh, do a a good job because we will just propagate the distribution from through the structural causal model and and we should should still get a relevant outcomes uh in this case now one of the challenges you could say here is that this requires a very uh rich specification of the causal model in particular we need to know the functions uh in the in the causal model and uh, if we only approximate them we can have challenges with uh, things like positivity assumption and and so on and so on so we might have certain areas of the distribution that we never observed in the past um this can be covered partially by expert knowledge but sometimes it might be challenging so alien attack might be challenging at least the first one yeah but i still feel, uh, feel yeah i mean by the explanation of your answer is that it still could be useful so it's better than just just random guessing or uh, using some conventional methods to predict something and uh, better utilize uh, causal machine learning even in this unheard uh, circumstances or events yeah it could be definitely i mean it really depends where those aliens are attacking right mm. so but i think um you know it's also about expectations um when we think about science uh maybe there's a cultural uh, a cultural a cultural uh, cultural a uh, topic here that at some point i feel like in general in western societies we started thinking about science as something that is absolute that just gives us uh, the ultimate explanation about the world how it works and so on and i think this is a very uns- unscientific way to think about science uh because what we have we have hypothesis and then we in popperian language you would say we are just trying to falsify them and as long we as we haven't falsified them we say like hey they still hold given all the data and all the measurement uh measurement tools that we have today uh so we say like this is a this theory has a good fit in evolutionary sense right that's that what he would say um so causal models are not something that is like a hyper science they have all the same limitations that science has um in in a sense they are an embodiment of of a scientific uh, of a scientific method mm, and and so i think that it is a disservice to the community to build expectations that causal models are like the ultimate uh, solution to anything and if we build them we just can close the door and the computer will will do everything for us uh, we might get close to this to this state in certain cases business or i don't know or other um or other or other contexts uh, but i i think it's it's not uh, it's 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 healthy to also be aware that those methods have have limitations and now if we think about strictly predictive methods the limitations um are more severe the last question uh, from me will be 
if <laughs> if i ask you is do you think uh, causal machine learning is better than machine learning or it's a better way of doing machine learning or the correct way of doing machine learning i don't think it's better i think i think a machine le- like predictive machine learning is amazing and you know i'm here because of predictive machine learning because one day i just read about those programs that can learn from experience and i was like i want to learn this it's it's so fascinating um i think the challenge today that we are facing is the challenge of the community sometimes missing the clear distinctions a, a clear distinction between where which questions can be answered with predictive associative machine learning and which questions might require a causal model or another active model um and i, I think this is the main challenge and um and i think realizing this uh that we have this challenge and working on addressing it is something that can move the entire ai community uh forward much faster thanks a lot thank you ishash i still have a question for you sure so you did so many things in your life uh worked in many different contexts in many different areas um you are also a cricket player some people that are starting with new things especially where there are complex things like machine learning or causality they might have a feeling that there is so much to learn that this is just overwhelming what would be your advice to those people i mean one of the reasons why i did this phd also was um, it was not just learning reading a lot of research papers but practically trying out different things and just getting your hands dirty so i know it's a lot of theoretical uh work a um, lot of research papers even right now in uh, the causal world there are a lot of things to read um, amazing books like yours and i think there are a few more so i i will say it's good to research a bit good to read a bit good to uh, watch these kind of amazing podcast but also you should just start on applying things start mm. on finding different use cases i think one of the good way also is to maybe try to whatever the conventional machine learning use case you would have done think it of as a causal problem and maybe see that how uh, causal machine learning can be more beneficial put your entrepreneurship hat on and see that what different values you can bring out uh, using causal ai so i think just get get your hands dirty do some research but uh, at some stage just just start executing things and that's where you'll start learning more too because people will ask you questions the questions will never stop they'll ask you that how you evaluate the model what if there are alien attacks or what if uh, this and that uh, so that's where you'll start learning more you'll go to the community you'll read uh, your book or you'll they'll reach out people to linkedin and trying to understand more so eventually you'll get really good at that uh, but yeah learning by doing what keeps you motivated So yeah, like I uh, mentioned earlier I come from a very interesting background of where my parents are doctors uh, my sister she's a doctor and I always see that in this world of data science we also have this capability to create a difference in people's life just 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 by doing our work and uh, that is something that keeps motivating me so if I'm working in a corporate I know that uh, I can end up like making a uh, some really amazing models that can result in making the company a lot of money or maybe i can make some of the uh, football clubs win championships or maybe i can predict uh, that some person will have a cancer so- soon so these are the things that uh, keep on motivating me and uh, i'll i'll say that even we are kind of a fancy doctors in the end where we can predict things as early as possible and sometimes even quicker than what uh, the conventional doctors will do what was the most challenging day in your career most challenging day i think the challenge is something that keeps on arriving every day especially if you live in this world of uh, production supply chain football clubs the challenge never never stops so i'll say the most challenging day for me always will be where i lose a bit of motivation yeah i mean every every day is different so i won't say uh, what was my most challenging day i'll say uh, one of the most different uh, days was my transformation or the change from coming from a football industry sports industry to to automotive industry 
that was challenging just because of uh, lack of knowledge of the domain domain knowledge so that was initially a bit overwhelming uh, but yeah i think um, once once you get into that you start learning more you start doing the proper networking uh, you you start learning more everything uh, keeps keeps uh, uh, taking care of that afterwards what helped you get going during this time of transition so i think the right people uh, near to me i think they really helped me i think um, uh, i've always been i think i've always been a good leader but i'm also a good follower and i think i've been lucky in life to have some amazing uh, role models be it my supervisors so i think uh, especially i'll give a shout out to my supervisor uh, in in bmw i think i learned a lot from him also he was my supervisor for my phd and these are the people who motivate you because you learn from that that maybe they also come from a humble background wanting to create a difference in in this world trying to solve real life problems and it just just motivates you a bit 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 more and uh, these are the people you want to be in the end so yeah these are the things that really motivate me and helped me in the, this difficult transition from uh let's say not even uh moving from a different industry but moving from different countries or uh, changing different cities because i earlier used to live in northern germany and then moving to south it's not always the easiest decision especially since you have a lot of friends and your family is back home so yeah just having the right people um uh, with you what are the qualities of a good leader so i always feel a leader should always lead from the front but also he should trust his people i think one of the things that i always feel is that you end up investing a lot of time in hiring these amazing people and then you just don't either trust them enough or you don't give them the freedom to do amazing work so fun is just be have that mindset of trusting them more give them all the freedom and then magic will, f- will flow uh and i think uh, always a thing uh, what what uh, apple said uh, always is stuck in the mind is best ideas always have to win there should not be any hierarchy so if as a leader you should be able to give positive and negative criticism uh, but also be able to have this capability to take in that criticism so if in a meeting let's say a leader will say something which is not appropriate he should have given this freedom to his uh, team to say that okay maybe in this meeting you are not acting like a ceo which is also this netflix mindset so i think these are definitely the characteristics that a leader should have where can people learn more about you and your work so i think uh, you can find a lot of information about me on linkedin you, you can you can go there read a lot of, about me on or, or my work on linkedin but also yeah i mean just approach to me reach out to me i'm usually uh, pretty active on uh, this this linkedin community and uh, if you happen to be in munich feel free like shoot me a message uh, and i always love networking with uh, people Uh, amazing people diverse people it does not always have to be about causal machine learning but just just about uh, the problem solving mindset or maybe some of the different experiences i had in different uh, countries or it could be a talk about poland yeah i think uh, just just feel free to reach to me on linkedin beautiful thank you so much it was a great conversation it was a pleasure ishesh thanks a lot like quest congrats on reaching the end of this episode of the causal bandits podcast stay tuned for the next one If you like this episode, click the like button to help others find it. And maybe subscribe to this channel as well. You know. Stay causal.